Good afternoon and welcome everybody to our final session of Shift in 2020 for this Wednesday. We hope you all enjoyed our roundtable discussion hosted by Oceanic Global on the topic of how we can regenerate industries for a sustainable future. We would like to welcome Professor Dr. Veronique Buñol for this online masterclass where she will discuss climate change and energy policies. Before we get started, we would like to talk to you about her expertise and background. Dr. Buñol holds a PhD in climate physics and a Master of Science in Technology and Policy from MIT. She currently teaches climate finance and climate risks at John Hopkins University. She is also the CEO of Clearly Energy, a provider of energy and climate data solutions to the real estate and finance industries. The company develops software solutions to help municipalities, home and building owners understand the energy and climate footprint of its building stock and find the smartest saving opportunities. Clearly Energy also analyzes the greenhouse gas impacts of corporate, municipal, sovereign and multinational green bonds. Prior to Clearly Energy, Dr. Bunyol founded Point Carbon North America, which was acquired by Thomson Reuters. Please be aware that all attendees during this masterclass will be muted, and we kindly ask you to make use of the question function within your GoToWebinar dashboard. Now it is time to learn more about climate change and energy policy. Please educate us, Professor Dr. Veronique Bunyol. The floor is yours. Okay. Um, we should be good to go. You should see the title slide. If that's not the case, somebody pop in and let me know. Um, okay. Well, um, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. Um, so what I'm, I entitled my presentation today, um, 10 Climate Risks, One Climate Opportunity. Um, I'm hoping this will be sort of slightly provocative, hopefully um, here and there a little eye opening. Um, what I'm gonna try to do is draw links from climate science and climate policy into sort of the, the economy, politics and, and impacts for, for all of us. And please submit questions. Um, I'm really hoping that that we can have a bit of a chat about this um, at the at the end of the session. So I thought I would sort of tee this up um, by uh, with a topic that that hopefully is close to your heart. It's not. I'm not necessarily. I'm definitely not an expert in hospitality, but I thought this was a good kickoff um, kickoff slide. Um, I do know something about snow and snow science. Um, so if you think of like, you know, climate risk to hospitality, this one obviously comes up, right? So in the US, the snow season has already shrunk by about by more than a month um, over the past 40 years, since 1980. So we have 40% less snow in the West than 40 years ago. In Europe, it's about the same. Um, the trend is about 11, 12% less snow per decade, which is which is really crazy when you think about it. So what does this mean, right? So does that mean the industry is doomed? The answer is probably not. Um, lower level resorts, maybe. Um, but for higher level resorts, it really means you know, more investments in snow snowmaking and, and targeting snowmaking to sort of make the season last. But I think more importantly, it's about diversifying activities, things that you all are hopefully thinking about, <laughs> um, how to kind of, you know, make it year round, um, year round fun. Um, but it does mean, and that's kind of what I'm going to try to do today, sort of not think about, you know, the obvious, but kind of trickle through. It also means that real estate investments in mountain resorts are becoming um, more and more risky. Okay, yeah? That looks beautiful. All right, here we go. Okay, um, all right. So um, that was number 10. So risk number nine is called stranded assets. So what is a stranded asset? So it's something that we assign value to today 
that may not have any value tomorrow or in 10 years or in 30 years. Now, obviously there's a reason why I put an oil rig um, on the slide, um, but stranded assets can be a lot of things. So for example, if there's a dramatic shift towards electric vehicles and you have an old gasoline or diesel car that you love and know where to fill it up, it becomes a stranded asset, no matter how much you love it, because nobody will want to buy it um, unless you put an electric engine in it. So why are stranded assets on the list and why are they a risk? So here's the deal. In 2015, the world agreed to try to limit global warming to two degrees Celsius. And that's what's called the Paris Climate Agreements, um, and ideally less than two degrees Celsius. Now, to meet the Paris climate goals, about two thirds of the oil reserves, which we know exist, um, have to stay in the ground. And yet, as of about a year ago, the top 10 energy companies in the world were considering about a trillion dollars, and so that's trillion with a T, of investment to pull these reserves out of the ground. So there's sort of a problem there, right? Either from a business standpoint, they are right to make these investments, and then we have a pretty big climate problem. Or um, climate policy will come around to sort of enforce the Paris climate goals, and those investments will turn out to be not so great and will turn into stranded assets. So which is it going to be? I don't know. Um, but if these investments don't turn out, there's a lot of jobs at stake. There's a lot of corporate value at stake. And so if companies don't proactively adapt, not even just to the existing policy landscape, but to the, what, the policy landscape that might be coming along, they're taking on uh, a tremendous amount of risk. And it's also worth noting that increasingly, pension funds, um, or even regular investment funds are starting to sort of shy away from investments that are deemed to have a high climate risk. So that's obviously coal, um, but increasingly it's, um, it's oil as well. So the short story on this is that obviously, you know, that trillion dollars should be invested in the new energy economy and not the old energy economy. So at number nine, I have fire. So that one is interesting because even three or five years ago, I would not have put it up there as a top 10 climate risk. Um, fire is incredibly difficult to ascertain the risk because it's obviously, it's obvious that higher temperatures um, combined with drought conditions, high winds, low humidity increases fire risk dramatically. What is really hard is to know what the fire risk would have been in the absence of global warming. And that's because there's a ton of interaction between the actual fires that we see and the ways forests are being managed, um, power lines which can cause fires, or even humans, which unfortunately cause a number of, of catastrophic fires. But that set aside, it is clear that fire risk um, is becoming an increasingly real risk and is um, can have tremendous health and economic impact. So in Portugal in 2017, 66 people died in um, wildfires. In 2018, fires burned about 2% of the land area in California. Um, beginning of 2020, that's that's recent enough that you should probably all remember Australia wildfires and burnt koalas. Um, and then the summer um, wildfires burnt about 4% of the land area in California. So that's huge. That's in, in three years, that's 6% of the land area in California that's, that's gone into flames. Um, so that's tragic and daunting. And it leads to terribly unhealthy um, air, you know, air pollution conditions, which probably actually has more kind of associated deaths than the direct deaths that you that you associated with um, with wildfires. 
Now to think through the economic impacts. So the campfire, which was one of the largest in, in California, destroyed 18,000 homes and destroyed about 400 and had caused about $400 billion in damages. Now to take it one step further, in, um, in California, in the United States, um, Pacific Gas and Electric, which is the electric company for Northern California, where the campfire took place, um, is the lar is the fifth largest utility in the country. It's a huge company, and it is now bankrupt. And it is bankrupt for one and only one reason, and that's climate risk, because it was deemed to have um, been responsible for that campfire, which destroyed the town of Paradise in California, because um, high voltage wires in the wind touched off the uh, the fire. So that has really kind of potentially dramatic consequences. Does that mean that every power line needs to go underground? I know in Switzerland, there's a lot more underground than in other parts of the world, but that has tremendous costs. Or does it mean that power is turned off when there are tremendous risks of a fire? And that's actually the approach that utilities took this summer. Um, but that in and of itself has pretty dramatic um, consequences. Okay, number seven, um, I have um, climate liability risk. So that one is really interesting. And I know you're reading the banner going, wait a minute, don't those guys kind of deserve it? Why is this, why is this a risk, right? So it's more than that, right? And it is true that right now, um, cities, individuals, um, organizations are suing big oil companies for climate damages. But that's kind of not the whole story, right? I mean, you could have, you know, the ski resort and they'll be sue ExxonMobil for messing up its great plans of, of winter skiing. Um, but, you know, would you, if you buy a home and it turns out that that home starts to flood all the time, would you turn around and sue the person who sold you the home um, for not disclosing the risk properly? Does that mean that a shop owner can sue a city because, you know, there's more and more flooding in front of their shop and that hurts their business? Um, does that mean that the country of Bangladesh can sue the United States for causing a large part of this mess, it really gets complicated really quickly. Um, now to understand kind of how climate climate liability sort of works and what it's trying to, to, to hit at, um, in the United States, the, the, the thrust of sort of the, the lawsuits is that since 1965, oil companies have caused a very large fraction of um, glo global, you know, greenhouse gas, fossil, flu fossil fuel related um, carbon dioxide emissions. The al allegation is also that at least since 1980, those companies knew of climate risks. They actually had really good <laughs> internal analysis um, of, of the climate risks. Um, and yet they championed kind of anti-science, they championed anti-regulation, and they really failed to pursue other alternatives. So the, um, the, um, the complaints are really not sort of environmental complaints. They fall under you know, the type of law that is saying that those companies are causing a public nuisance. So it's a much more kind of plain vanilla, boring part of the law than trying to leverage climate law to get um, to get damages. So it's alleging public nuisance or private nuisance, um, product liability, that they essentially put out a product that was faulty um, and they should not have been doing that and negligence because they did not take action when um, when when they when they knew better. So if you want a more kind of real world European case in Europe, um, there is a Peruvian farmer that is suing RWE, which is one of Germany's largest um, electric companies in German court. 
And the farmer claims that a lake is threatening to overflow its land as a result of glaciers retreating. Um, and that creates risk of flooding to his home. And so he wants to hold our art of you responsible for that, for, for its part in global warming. And this is kind of where it gets interesting is sort of connecting the, the dots, right? The, the cause and, and effect. Um, so the allegation is that RWE um, caused about a half a percent of global greenhouse gas emissions, kind of if you take all emissions throughout history. And therefore, if it's going to cost three and a half million euros to drain the, the farm, the lake that the farmer is complaining about, RWE should be held liable for a half a percent of that, which is 17,000 euros. So that's an example of kind of a climate lawsuit that tries to truly tie kind of responsibility to, um, to impacts. Now, of course, it doesn't stop there, right? Because the day that a climate lawsuit is successful, which has not happened really yet, um, the question will be who pays? And it's likely that it will be the insurance companies that will pay. And so every company is then gonna start bearing increased insurance costs um, for perceived um, climate liability risk. Okay. Number six. Number six is a more kind of intuitive risk to people. Um, that's one that you can relate to. Um, I think everybody has a pretty good sense that storms are getting kind of crazier, um, wilder. What you're seeing on the chart are insurance costs over the past um, roughly 40 years. It doesn't go all the way to, um, to the last two years. Um, um, but so I'm going to take this opportunity to do sort of a, a, a little tiny bit of, of, um, of climate science. So, and it's really quite simple. So warmer air can hold more moisture. That's something that we all intuitively know, right? Your skin's going to get dry in the winter because there's a lot less, um, humidity, moisture in the air. Um, than, than in the summertime. So storms are getting more intense because there is more moisture in the atmosphere. Not everywhere, not all the time. That's in a way that the crazy thing about climate change is that extremes get more extreme. So you have at the same time, you know, catastrophic rainfalls and in other places around the world, drought conditions. Um, but moisture in the atmosphere is what makes it exciting, right? It's clouds, it's motion, it's energy. And so what we have is, is kind of an atmosphere on, on steroids, if you want to think about it. It does not mean that storms are necessarily more frequent. It just means that storms are more um, intense. So one way to think about it is how frequently extreme events happen. So an event that is now a one in a hundred year kind of event, right? So it's going to rain 20 centimeters in one day, and that's a one in a hundred year event. By the end of the century, that'll be a one every 33 year event. Now, obviously that doesn't happen. That doesn't mean that it happens every 33 years. It just means that it's likely to happen three times a century as opposed to one times a century. So everything that was sort of calibrated um, to 100 year storms, um, and there's a lot of things that rely on that. So like flood zones can be defined by, you know, are you in, are you in the 100 year storm flood zone? All of a sudden, everything has to be kind of reassessed and, and reevaluated. Now, to get a concrete sense of what is an extreme event, in 2017, and I think that's not even on, the cost is not even on, on this slide, um, Hurricane Harvey, which was not really a particularly intense hurricane, um, dumped 48 inches. Now, 48 inches is roughly a meter 40 of rain on Houston um, over the span of two or three days. And it pretty much flooded the whole city and cost $125 billion in damages. Um, and when you have tremendous rain 
events, it also means more people are likely to suffer from these events. So for example, when Thailand um, had catastrophic floods, I think it was in 2011, um, about, a, about 13 million people were directly affected. About 80% of the kind of the counties in Thailand were um, somehow affected by the floods. So yes, our, our imagination is, is, is actually pretty good at capturing the really big catastrophic events. But what about sort of the more day-to-day -day consequences of being able to manage these catastrophic events? So if all of a sudden you have to be able to sort of, you know, manage much more water in urban areas, that means, for example, that every single drainage pipe, every single sewage system has to potentially be revisited and be rebuilt bigger. And that has, um, that has tremendous cost implications. All right, number five. Um, number five, I have technology risk with a really kind of, so far I've been really nice and giving you kind of pretty pictures to look at, um, but I love this. Um, this flow chart, it's not new, um, but it's, um, it's, it's a great illustration. Um, now, to be fair, technology risk is sort of equal part risk um, and opportunity. Um, the thing I'm trying to get at is that we need massive technological change, right? And so to illustrate technological change, I put this, this little diagram out. Um, and full disclosure, this is kind of a, a second version of it that was done by by the company Ecofis um, in 2010. The original version of it was the United States Greenhouse Gas Emissions Flowchart, which was done by the World Resources Institute. So here's what it shows. On the right, at the end here, on the right, is the greenhouse gas emissions. CO2 is carbon dioxide. That's the big one. That's what you get when you burn any kind of fossil fuel, coal, natural gas, oil, they all end up as carbon dioxide and water. The next one is CH4 is methane. Um, that comes from cows, that comes from agricultural emissions. Um, and then you have some others further down. So you have some industrial gases and you have um, uh, nitrous oxide, which also comes partly from, from ag agriculture. And then in the middle chunk, you have which sector of the economy is causing these emissions. So you have industry in green, in yellow. I don't know how much of this you can kind of read, so I'll kind of talk you through it. You have industry, then you have residential buildings in yellow, um, commercial buildings in blue. That's where, that's where you're headed in terms of hotel management and responsibility transport in purple, agriculture in red, um, energy supply down there in pink, and then land use changes in brown, and, and that's unfortunately um, largely the burning of forests in Brazil and in Indonesia, um, to some degree in Africa as well. Um, it's actually a huge percentage of, of global emissions, and historically it's actually probably almost even more. Um, but so the optimistic take on this flow chart is that we actually are starting to figure some of this out, right? So take the easy one, not the easy from sort of a technology standpoint, but easiest to understand. Transport, the purple one, comes from oil. So if you flow through it, right, the black of the oil become every, you know, uh, yeah, every car, every bus, every truck, every plane, uses some form of gasoline, diesel, you name it, right? So um, most of the world's oil goes into transport and all of that becomes carbon dioxide emissions. Now at this point, we sort of know how to fix this, right? That means electrify all of transport. Um, we've pretty much figured it out for cars, trucks, might be some hydrogen and some electric batteries, who knows? Um, you know, ships might still be a bit more complicated, but probably some pretty interesting applications with, with hydrogen and fuel cells, airplanes. Well, we haven't quite figured out airplanes yet, um, but you can start to see that, that you know, there is a technological solution for this 15%. Um, 
if we look at um, buildings, so what goes into buildings is two things, right? Part of it is electricity and the other part is all the buildings that use natural gas primarily to heat the buildings. Um, so again, you can look at that and say, well, we know how to we know how to do this now, right? The electricity part, you need clean electricity. And for the natural gas part, well, you need to replace natural gas. And there's still a bunch of oil burners, which is why you have a little bit of black in there. Um, you need to replace all of those kind of fossil fuel sources of energy with um, electric, right? And I'm not going to get into the technological details, but that's essentially what needs to happen is electrify everything and make the electricity clean. And if you look at industry, most of what's going into industry is actually electricity um, for industrial applications. So it's the same logic. If you can clean up the electricity, you can clean up industrial emissions. And yes, you're going to have to sort of figure out how to produce cement without emitting things. That's kind of this, you can't probably see it, but there's like a little gray thing that links direct emissions um, into industry. That's largely cement related emissions. So I'm not saying we figured everything out, um, but I am trying to kind of show you that there is a way. Now, the reason why it's a climate risk is because um, that means a lot of firms are going to have to um, a lot are going to have to adapt and, and adapt quickly if we want to if we want to deal with this. Um, it also means that we need to find solutions for the things we don't have solutions yet, right? So, how do you make cows? So that red over here that goes into agriculture and then methane, a large chunk of that is cows burping and cows doing other things, right? We haven't figured that one out. We haven't figured out how to make planes run on hydrogen, for example. Um, we haven't really figured out how to take carbon dioxide out of the air to compensate for what's left over, um, short of planting trees. So we need this technological change to happen, to have no emissions left over here by 2050, which is what we need. The technological change really needs to happen in the next 10 to 15 years. And that's not a lot of time, and that's going to leave people behind, hence the risk. Okay, number four. I hope you're still all with me. I'm going to go four, three, two, one. <laughs> okay, number four is drought and food production. Um, okay, so as temperatures rise, become, weather in general becomes less predictable. Um, extreme rainfall events damage crops, but droughts damage crops as well. So what you have on this picture is the expected drought frequency in percent per decade um, now, in 2030 and in 2050. So if you want to take a concrete example and you're running a hotel in Spain, by 2050, you can expect to have more than eight out of 10 years to be kind of classified as being in drought condition. That's sort of the dark. Right. So it doesn't mean you can't run a hotel um, in these conditions. It just means you have to kind of start planning for it today. Um, so generally, when it gets really hot, people are less productive. Jakobabad in Pakistan is pretty much the hottest city um, on Earth, and it's now routinely more than 50 degrees Celsius. So when it's 50 degrees Celsius, um, you know, and you drop water onto the pavement, that water evaporates immediately. It's um, when it's that hot, that means you can really only work outside at night. So a lot of like work patterns have to shave, have to have to change. It also means that people become increasingly dependent on some kind of cooling, which then in turn draws energy to survive, right? The most at risk, whether it's the elderly, or whether it's there was a case of a breakdown in 
the electricity system within that city, which is kind of why it's become a case study, um, the hospital lost its electricity and six babies in the intensive care unit died as a consequence because they're just too vulnerable and it got too hot. Um, now, if you think of, of heat and drought um, and what foods, you know, how we're gonna feed ourselves. So some crops, will do fine in hotter conditions. Um, and some places will do just fine. You know, Canada can expect to grow more crops than it does today. And probably the same for like Germany and Poland and places like that. Um, but there's still gonna be a lot more stress um, on food production in places that are now major, major bread baskets. Um, and all of that is happening at the same time as population is increasing, right? So by 2050, there should be about 10 billion of us on the planet, which means food production has to grow by anywhere between 60 to 100%. So, you know, we, we pretty much almost have to double food production between now and 2050. And that food will be produced under kind of more stress than today. And so, yes, technology will help food make crops more resilient. Um, but it's clear that there's going to be more stress on that whole production chain. Um, okay, number three, population migration. So going from crop stress to population migration is, is I won't say it's an easy step. That sounds horrible. It's, it's an intuitive step, right? So according to the World Bank, by 2050, we can expect about 140 million people to become displaced um, in large part because of climate change. Now the causes can be flooding. You're looking at a picture from, you know, rice paddies in low-lying Delta in Bangladesh being flooded. Um, it could be low-lying nations that are simply flooded out. Um, it could be people in Sub-Saharan Africa that are living on pretty marginal subsistence agriculture um, that simply is no longer viable. So it can be um, a lot of places. And it's typically not just climate change, but it's climate change making other things worse. Now the problem is when large numbers of people start moving, they typically go to, go to cities. Um, and that puts an incredible amount of, of infrastructure stress onto cities. So in Southeast Asia, the problem is that most of the destination cities for these migrants are themselves at very high climate risk. Um, so then it's not just 140 million people that are actually displaced, but then it becomes more like 800 million people that are expected to have lower living conditions um, because of deteriorating conditions in, in, urban, um, in urban areas. Um, all right, number two is policy risk. Okay, so policy, yes, um, but why is it a risk by itself? So policy risk is really lacking the predictability or not knowing for corporations or even individuals what the best adaptation path is. So if we take the policy landscape, um, at the highest level, we have the Paris Climate Agreement, um, which is trying to keep temperatures between one and a half and two degrees. Um, the, the way Paris works, it's not, you know, this sort of global policeman telling countries what to do at all. It's sort of structured in the opposite direction. It allows every country to come to the table with their own climate um, mitigation objectives, really in whatever unit or format they want. Um, and so if we add up what we currently have as these Paris pledges, um, we're anywhere between 3.4 and 3.8 Celsius. So it's not good enough, right? Now, Paris also says that every five years, countries need to come back to the table with more ambitious climate um, mitigation goals. Um, so we're in the first period. We don't know really what the second period will say, but we're starting to see some interesting things happening. 
so Europe, which is kind of so what you're seeing here kind of in this in this diagram, which was put together by the Climate Action Tracker, is how the country's um, domestic or group policies when it comes to the European Union add up in what what do they mean in terms of degrees of warming, right? So you have the countries that are deemed critically insufficient, including the one that, that I'm currently in, the United States. Um, you have um, countries like you have the European Union, which is somewhere around insufficient. Uh, and then you have a few that are doing more. And we can kind of discuss how this was built. They're either doing more or they're emitting less, right? So India and the Philippines emissions are going up and going up rapidly. Um, but on a per capita basis, they actually emit a whole lot less than, than we do in, in the Western world. So it's a combination of existing, of, of emissions intensity of the countries and the ambition of their policy goals. Now, what is interesting is literally in the past couple months, um, there's been kind of a new level of ambition for some of this. So Europe is pretty serious. It doesn't have rules in place yet to get to zero emissions by 2050, but it has that goal as a stated um, objective. Um, generally speaking, the European Union is not too bad at meeting its objectives. Um, some sectors, like the power sector and um, um, an industry, are actually under a carbon cap. Um, the other sectors, which is primarily transport and buildings, is um, definitely struggling a bit more um, to meet their goals. So the Europe still has a lot of work to do to put policies in place to get to what is called net zero by 2050. Um, but at least it has that as a goal. Um, and since then, China has actually said their goal is net zero by 2060. And not to be outdone by China, Japan and South Korea followed suit within literally two weeks um, and said that their goal is net zero emissions by 2050. So since this was done, in theory, some of these countries or areas are kind of moving right to a more two degree compatible um, world. I think most experts will tell you that we're gonna go through one and a half degrees. Um, some people still like to kind of hold on <laughs> to, to that. Um, um, to, to, to that notion, um, but what is also becoming increasingly clear is that the consequences of more than two degrees warming are probably going to be fairly catastrophic, and, and we've kind of already just, you know, rattled them off. Um, and that obviously leaves the United States right now without much of a coherent climate policy, but, you know, we'll come back in a few months and hopefully have, have more to say. Um, at least countries like Brazil, which actually has is going to have a tremendous increase in emissions this year from from fires. Um, India, um, you know, may still look good, but um, has a lot to do on the policy front. Which leaves us with the number one risk, which is, and again, this is my ranking, um, and you're welcome to disagree with it. Um, so I have sea level rise as the number one climate risk. Um, and these are two pictures actually from not very far from, from where I live. The left is just a picture of a road. Um, and what's interesting is that this is on a sunny day. This is not in the middle of a storm, right? This is what you're gonna call clear sky flooding or nuisance flooding. This is just the world's oceans going up and they're going up for three reasons. One is that warmer water takes more space. Pretty simple to understand. Two is um, snow and ice is melting, in particular Greenland. And three is that land areas, depending on where you are, are either going up or going down. Um, I'm in a place that's um, going down, which does not help. Um, the northern part of Europe, for example, is still going up, which can compensate for some of these, um, some of this sea level rise. 
So why is it the number one risk? Well, for starters, there are a lot of people who live near the coast. I know you're in Switzerland and um, it's less obvious when you're in Switzerland, but there are about two and a half billion people that live within a hundred kilometers of the coast. There are about 600 million people that live at less than 10 meters elevation. So there are a lot of you know, people at risk. Um, if you think of the cities that are on the coast and that are relatively flat, you have a lot of really, really big places. You have Hong Kong, you have Shanghai, Shanghai, you have Tokyo, you have Sydney, you have Houston, you have New York, you have Jakarta, you have Mumbai, you have Mexico, and on and on and on, right? So the rich cities are essentially gonna wall themselves in and they will be able to afford that. That's essentially infrastructure. So New York is already building kind of a loop around the lower third of Manhattan. Um, it's not called a wall, it's called something much more um, exotic and, and interesting, but that's essentially what it is. Um, Singapore is gonna invest $100 billion to protect itself. So we're gonna kind of be like the Dutch, right? And living behind um, a dike. Smaller places won't be able to afford that and rural areas will, essentially people will have to move, um, which then leads to migration. But the real reason why I have it as number one is that if we can contain global warming to say two degrees, there are a lot of things that will stabilize. There might be more risks, there might be more intense storms, um, but it'll stabilize. Um, that's not the case with sea level rise, right? Once we start melting Greenland, which we have, I'm not saying it's gonna melt all the way, but it's like a really, really big train that's gonna be really, really hard to slow down and stop. It's gonna take centuries to stop um, sea level rise, even if we stop global warming tomorrow. Um, and so the only shot we have really is, is sort of slowing it down. So those were my top 10 climate risks. And I want to leave you with hopefully a little bit, um, a, a little bit, um, op not, you know, not optimistic view on this, but the big opportunity, right, is, is change. And that's, that's you in a way, right? You're students, you're the next generation, you can change things. Um, we've actually made incredible progress over the past 10 years, right? We've figured out clean energy. The cheapest forms of electricity production now are wind and solar. Not everywhere, not all the time, but generally that is that is true. So we still have to figure out how to store the electricity because the sun doesn't shine all the time and the wind doesn't blow all the time. Um, but there's incredible progress that's been done there. And now it's a matter of sort of scaling it and ramping it up and deploying that clean electricity everywhere. We're not far away from figuring out transport, tra transport sector, right? Electric cars, electric cars are awesome. Um, if we can make green power, a lot of industry becomes cleaner. Um, now the good news is that if we can clean up all this production, it also means that we get healthier air, healthier living conditions. If you don't have gas stoves or propane stoves inside um, homes and buildings, the indoor air quality um, improves. So yes, there's some things which we haven't figured out. I don't know if we all need to become vegetarians um, or if Beyond Meat is really a thing um, to stay. Um, but, um, uh, you know, th there's, there, we're not going to solve the problem tomorrow, but but we've already um, done a lot of progress. So my sort of takeaway for you is embrace change. Change is good. I think you're still in a business that is still figuring it out, um, but that is figuring it out with a positive um, mindset. The one thing I will leave you with is that we don't have a lot of time to figure this out, right? The change for us to be at zero emissions by 2050 change really needs to happen in the next 10 or 15 years. So with that, I will um, happily take questions. Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Veronique. That's, uh, that was very interesting. First of all, to, to just hear you 
talk about this and put this uh, back uh, into perspective. I mean, obviously, when it comes to climate change, we can see that there's a lot of things happening. Now, do you feel at some point that people may have been waiting too long for the ultimate moment, moment now to run and catch up? Because only now it seems to be irreversible and that climate change is being, yeah, you know, it, it's going to happen, yes or yes. And now it's just a matter of trying to mitigate how much percentage of degrees we are rising with. I mean, do you feel that people have been having their ideas in the closet, maybe because of lobbyists, I would even say, if that's something that uh, having certain industries having a very large footprint on their economies and therefore not wanting to see these new elements being introduced in the marketplace? Um, yes, um, things are, um, sorry, trying to figure out where, where I went, here we go. Um, Yes, it's taken too long. And that's why I say, for example, you know, one and a half degrees is essentially baked in at this point. Um, probably a lot of people would argue that we've already baked in two degrees, right? No matter what actions we do now, we're sort of racing to avoid three degrees and kind of more catastrophic things. Um, and yes, lobbyists have a huge responsibility in kind of blocking blocking things. And it's it's obviously, it's more than just corporate lobbyists. It's a dynamic of, and you have a very similar dynamic in Europe and in the United States where, because resources um, are, are distributed differently, you have either countries or states that are kind of more dependent on, on legacy resources, right? So um, on, on fossil fuels and that, that have, you know, it's, it's more threatening. To, to them. Um, what I will say though is that we're starting to see pressure come um, from from areas that matter, right? Every company right. needs money to finance itself. And the financial mm -hmm. sector has done too little too late, sure, but it's starting to turn around pretty quickly. Right. And not just say, look, we're not going to fund coal. This is done, right? Um, we're going to kick out X, Y, and Z from our portfolios of investments because we don't think that they're compatible with a climate, you know, friendly future. Mm -hmm. um, and that puts a lot of pressure on, on what the companies can actually do. So yes, it's still too little <laughs> too late, um, but it's actually changing pretty fast now. Right. But I mean, I mean, if you feel that is the, the one and a half, two degrees, even at this point, too optimistic, or I mean, as you said, it's baked in. I mean, obviously, yep. the United States was on the left end of your uh, of your little <laughs> list. Um, and as you mentioned, I'm sure that we will probably see, uh, hopefully, a re-signing of the United States once we have a new commander in chief in the White House from January onwards. Um, do you feel that it is too optimistic? Are we what 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 realistically are we looking at? Because that also comes back to your drought and food production uh, prediction that we saw in the in the slide, is that the hospitality industry itself is obviously very dependent on not just but the temperature rise. I mean, Spain might become too hot, and it is then we're we're, we're seeing are we having enough? countries on this bandwagon now i mean are we needing to educate our our smallest of kids when we when we start to educate them on on how we should be doing things are we going to be vegetarian <laughs> yeah i'm i'm always torn up because um a big part of me is a kind of a technology optimist and it doesn't mean you can fix everything with technology i know what i sort of left out of this presentation is well how about we reduce our consumption instead of just trying to kind of patch things technologically right so i did have you know low Greta, impact beef right i yeah, did I saw, have Greta I saw, I saw on the picture <laughs> and she kind of symbolizes that right her take is don't travel be vegan that's how you do your part um, but that's not realistic is it Right, that's kind of my take on it. And that's kind of why I kind of look at it more as this incredible change. Like 10 years ago, we knew climate change was a big risk, but we had no idea how to get there, right? right. Um, 
in the sense that renewables were expensive. We did not know how to store it. Uh, we had no electric cars. And so it was sort of like, it was a daunting problem, but now mm -hmm. it's sort of like, yes, a 90% of cars are still have, you know, combustion engines. I, I realize that probably 95, I don't know what the percentage is. Um, and I don't know what the sales numbers are for Switzerland, but I'm guessing that now probably a third of new cars are electric or plug-in. Um, yeah, they're Canada, still obviously getting a lot of grants, so people are also having the possibility yeah. to now buy these, but as soon as that becomes yeah, more... Yeah, the costs are coming down faster than, mm. than the grants are going away, right? So the cost of the batteries in the car have decreased. You know, they're a fraction of what they were five years ago, 10 years right. ago. Solar production is 20% and wind are less than 20% of the cost that they were 10, 15 years ago. Those are crazy, crazy drops in, in costs. Um, so, so the takeaway is that, no, we're nowhere near being there, but we sort of see a light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe it's not the end of the tunnel, but we see a light, right? We're still right. in the tunnel. And do you feel um, that we should maybe stop traveling altogether or become more climate friendly in, in the way that we travel, that there is going to be a different options, stay closer to home, don't make those long trips? I don't know. I like traveling. <laughs> yeah, you're obviously in the United States right now and you have family still in Switzerland, so, I'm sure. Um, so, yeah. You know, I mean, what I have, I have an electric car and I have from feel no guilt in taking my car. Yes, you know, the car was made with steel and it'll have to be recycled at the end. But, um, but that part of the guilt thing is gone. Um, so yeah, as I said a couple times, and I think there's a panel on tomorrow Friday that'll talk about it. You know, we haven't figured out how to make airplanes clean. Yeah, that's yet, a, that's a roundtable discussion. Um, um, exactly. So so we we haven't figured everything out. Um, but I kind of look at it. Net zero does not mean that there's no emissions. It means that whatever's left is is offset by planting trees, by Taking carbon dioxide out of the air, I'm not a huge fan of kind of the sequestration. Um, so far, so far, those technologies have not come down in costs, right? So they're they're not competitive, period. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe. Um, but net zero does not mean, you know, that's kind of why, like, well, maybe you just eat less meat, right? Does that does yeah. that mean you have to eat no meat? Um, but it also comes back to the fact of like, where is your locally sourced meat from? Whether you have low impact beef or high impact beef, for instance, is uh, you can have obviously eco-sustainable farmers that are still getting their grain from certain countries, perhaps feeding well, these cows. Well, yes and no, right? Because the cows burp and kind of fart no matter no matter what they eat. I mean, yes, they, they burp less if you feed them alfalfa, um, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but it's more for getting your resources from other places that yeah. are still needing. Yes. Or are we growing? Are we are we uh, making hay all year round? Are we making sure that uh, from 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 uh, farm farm to fork, if you will, you yeah. know, from the moment that you can see these animals growing up to having their food on the other land? I mean, that's something that we maybe need to look into as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. You kind of want to reduce, and that's kind of more, um, you know, sort of general kind of corporate sustainability. I obviously took a really kind of high level <laughs> view today of, of things, um, but corporate sustainability is all about reducing impacts along the production chain, along the, um, you know, the supply chain. So reducing transport, at least right now, is a big part of it. Um, but um, um, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm seeing a little bit of time here, so we're about to run over. So I would like to start to uh, round it up. I still had one question coming in that you, uh, we know you love mountains and snow. This is what uh, Jocelyn uh, has told us. And <laughs> she, what are your thoughts about the glaciers melting globally? If we can just, as a, as a final point, uh, maybe just ask that. Ah, glaciers. Um, yeah, glaciers in Europe are kind of, they're kind of doomed. Um, it's, um, yeah. 
that's sad. Not, there's no like, like there's nothing coming. <laughs> you just like okay, that that's it. We need to start taking saying goodbye to these. Uh, I, these I don't people. think I don't think that means skiing is doomed. No, uh, I don't think that the industry is doomed. I think um, you know I was I was on the advisory board of a project which is trying to sort of figure out how to optimize snow production um, so that you can keep places running longer and it, you know I know it's sad <laughs> but it's still better it's still better than nothing um, but the problem with with glaciers and and that even applies to to Greenland right is is you um, you know you start a couple things happen so this is pure sort of climate science you, you start melting them and a couple things happen so instead of having a beautiful white surface that reflects all of the incoming yeah. sunlight or 90 percent of it you have this kind of slush thing that's full of water and that absorbs more heat right and then instead of having kind of layers and layers of snow so okay you have a hot winter you have a hot summer and you you melt some snow but then you build it back up so instead of kind of every summer um melting the snow and staying sort of in, in snow area, which is yes. reflective, you go to ice, which is a lot less reflective. So that's why this process with, with the glaciers in Greenland is so hard to turn around right. is because once you kind of, you know, once you kind of are, are getting down to ice um, in the summer, then you're like, okay, now I'm absorbing heat instead of reflecting it and I'm going to melt some more. And the whole so thing it's accelerating. is accelerating. It's a like vicious, a downward. Not yeah, a vicious it's just, exactly it's it's a bad spiral um so so that's why i had my number one risk of sea level rise and and i'm very happy for people to disagree um but it's because i don't see how we're stopping that one right we can stop the warming um by stopping emissions i don't see how we're stopping um the melting of right of at least the glaciers we have in europe glaciers pretty much everywhere and and even a good chunk of greenland Hmm. But it's not all lost, like you say. We have to stay optimistic. So to just round it off, not to stay on a very negative note. Um, but anyway, can I just thank you very much, uh, Dr. Veronique, uh, for your your insights and this. It uh, was very entertaining to see you run through your slides once we got them working. Uh, that's uh, it was great to see that. And uh, if there are any more questions that one has, you can always send them to uh, to the shift in organization and i would like to also uh, just be aware for all of you that are still with us that we will be having another keynote starting tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock 10 a.m european time central european time about the wine industry 2.0 uh, together that is uh, yeah exactly you know there's lots of wine being produced here you know that as a swiss, uh, swiss <laughs> Um, so we would like everybody to join and if you haven't registered yet please go ahead and uh, and register and we'd love to see you there tomorrow so again it leaves me uh, to just uh, thank you once again and i uh, Pleasure. i wish you a very pleasant continuation of your day thank you thanks for everybody for for listening in um and yeah i did not put my email there but please relay questions or discussions if you you know want to have a discussion about any of this excellent we leave you here and we wish everybody a very nice day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.